Hello and welcome to the Paranet Podcast by Focus on the Family Singapore. In each podcast, we'll be tackling questions that parents are asking about family life, parenting, work life, and so much more. So join us on this journey of discovery together. Hello and welcome to the Paranet Podcast. My name is June and I'm your host for this episode. In today's VUCA world, VUCA meaning volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. Equipping children with grit is perhaps more crucial than ever. Grit, the combination of passion and perseverance towards achieving our long-term goals. Angela Duckworth, author of the book Grit, defines it as intense passion plus intense persistence. It's almost every parent's dream for their child, as this is a foundational life skill that can empower our kids to navigate the challenges that will undoubtedly come their way. At a time where tech is moving at such a breakneck speed, and along with it, a lot of changes in industries and also career prospects, fostering grit in children is perhaps a good way to ensure that they are adaptable and able to bounce back even after meeting adversity. So joining me today to explore this topic of grit is Paul Lim, father of three children aged 10, 12, and 17. He is also Senior Lecturer of Organisational Behaviour and Human Resources at SMU. And interestingly, he did his thesis on this very topic of resilience. Welcome to the Paranet Podcast, Paul, and thank you for joining us today. Thanks for having me, June. Would you like to start by introducing yourself to our listeners? I'm a lecturer based at the School of Business at the Singapore Management University. I've been doing this for about 15, 16 years. Before that, I started in uh, the industry. I was doing marketing, advertising, and the last position I was looking after one of the noodle brands for the Singapore office. And then subsequently, I did a career switch and I went into education. So the topics I teach now at the university, both at the undergraduate and postgraduate levels, would be things like ethics, corporate responsibility, leadership, negotiation, and a HR topic called employer branding. Maybe we'll do a deep dive into today's topic. Can you help to unpack this word for us? How does it show up in daily life? So this idea of grit is something that was made popular by these researchers, I think Martin Seligman and Angela Lee Duckworth at the University of Pennsylvania. Martin Seligman came from the branch of positive psychology. He talks a lot about it, and I believe there's definitely benefit about this. And even in the word itself, it gives you a sense of ruggedness and uh, enthusiasm about hitting your goals. Mm. And there's nothing wrong. Um, the study, I think, that Angelie Duckworth was basing it on was on, I think, some US military academy kind of sample. And so it became very popular. And that study reinforced what people felt that you know, it was needed in a time when things were tough or things were getting a bit uh, uncertain, like you mentioned about VUCA just mm. now. I tend to look at something else. It's called hardiness. And hardiness says that, okay, the consistent direction and perseverance towards a goal is a good thing. But mm -hmm. we need to sort of take steps to recalibrate, to think through things. And so that particular theory that I look at is called hardiness. So hardiness includes the aspect of, you mentioned a little bit of reflection to review which direction you're going. So it does not necessarily mean just keep pressing on. Right. So if I were to give an example, if let's say I am traveling on this road, I see a wall. Mm. Grit would suggest that, okay, I have to go to my destination beyond the wall. So mm. I keep hitting the wall such that either the wall breaks or my head breaks. <laughs> okay. So, so there's a commitment and it's a, a deliberate, passionate commitment towards your goal. And I think in Singapore, a lot of us can identify with that. I see in my students, I see in my colleagues and friends in industry where they say that, oh, if I am having a shortcoming in something, I want to push further. I must work harder. Mm. So if my students, they say that they got a bad grade this time, they say they will work harder. But I think a lot of Singaporeans already work very hard. And another topic that I like to talk about is procrastination. And procrastination is a side topic, but a lot of people feel they procrastinate because they're lazy. Actually, it's not. It's because it's an emotional regulation issue which I will not talk about today, but I think a lot of Singaporeans have this challenge of not knowing when to stop, recalibrate, and mm. think about whether they should continue on the same path mm. or they should 
put in more effort in a certain area. And so let me quickly give you the three C's of hardiness. Sure. Yep, the three C's, the first one is commitment, where you remind yourself that I'm committed to the task. Second one is to take control of what you can control and to let go of control where you cannot. And this is very tough for a lot of us because I think we want to control everything in our lives. Yes, right? that's what we are known for, right? And we are known for that. <laughs> and the thing is, we, you can't control everything. And this is a very tough exercise for many people. So the second C is to take control of what you can and mm. to let go of what you cannot. The third one is to see an obstacle not as a threat to run away from, but as a challenge mm. to overcome. So these are the three C's. The first one, commitment to the task. Second one, to control what you can and mm. to let go of what you cannot. And third, to see the issue not as a threat, but as a challenge to overcome. Commitment, control, and challenge. Perhaps in your everyday experience, you know, interacting with your students at the university, could you share which of these three C's comes up as a very frequent point of struggle for our kids? Our students definitely are very committed to the task. Yes. I mean, I deal with university students. They're aged between 19 to about 25 because the guys are a bit older. I think the other thing that they're pretty good at is to see their shortcomings as a challenge to overcome. Okay. Although sometimes they see the difficulties as too big a threat, and so they forget about when to let go of control, which mm -hmm. is, I think, the second one. So right. I think the biggest challenge for our young people and even our population at large is yeah. the issue of control. So really what some of the struggles that we as adults face in this area of control, which I can relate and I can also see very frequently happening around me, is this fear of losing control and this desire to have that intense control over everything. I mean, in a sense, it's a good thing. We want to see the job well done. We want to know that we have run the race well. But at the same time, where is that? wisdom in knowing when to perhaps take a rest or mm -hmm. to recalibrate as you said earlier. It's interesting to talk about this because I just came back from a 11, 12 day uh, trip when I took my students to uh, 30 of them to Indonesia to do an employer branding consulting project on mm. for Indonesian companies. And this was very interesting because I'm putting them in an environment where they're not familiar with. It's a different culture, mm. even though it's not far away from Singapore, but it's a totally different culture. The way they work, the way they play, everything is different. And very soon they realized that they could not control all the variables they wanted to. I only gave them five days to collect data, to process the data, and to present the data, and to come up with a full report to two of our stakeholders, and one of which is a state-owned enterprise in Indonesia, and the other one is a top FMCG, fast-moving consumer goods company. In the face of these challenges, of course, there was a lot of lack of sleep, so <laughs> commitment to the task, they did very well. They didn't shy away from the challenge, so they continued, but it's not seeing as a threat. They said that we have to overcome this, and they were good at that. Mm. But what I realized that they were very stressed about mm. the things that they could not control. Right. So let me give an example. Up to the last minute, we did not even know whether one of the stakeholders was going to appear at the presentation. Okay. Now, this shook a lot of the students. There were a lot of questions, a lot of uncertainties, and truth be told, we only knew that they were appearing for the presentation half an hour before the presentation. Okay. Right. So my advice to the students very early on, the few hours before the presentation was like, can you control whether they come or not? No. Okay. Mm. So what can you do? What can you control? Well, you can't control their being here or not, but you can control about the preparedness. And what you do not have answers to, at least know someone who can help you. So mm. I don't have to know all the answers, but I have access to people who can give me the answers. Mm. So in that sense, I said, okay, just bring your laptops, dress up. Prepare and, yeah. for as if, as if right? he or she is going exactly, to be there. Right? right? Because and, that's the worst case scenario in that sense. I mean, in, in a sense, of course, I don't want to use the word worst case scenario because yes. there are a lot of worst case scenarios. There could be a lot. And in different countries, different things are done differently. I have gone to presentations where I could not use the cable because it was broken. The Wi-Fi in the system wasn't working. So how do you access internet? So anything can go wrong. Mm -hmm. but what and can yet you the show must go and on. And yet the show must go on. But <laughs> what can you control, right? You can control the fact that you don't have to freak out. You can control the fact that you have a presentation. And I said, worst come to worst, there's no Wi-Fi or internet, just use your handphone. Can, right? If there are no slides, if there are no printers around to print the, the hard copies, then someone carry the laptop and give it to the client. And then the rest will just focus. I mean, you can deal with it. In fact, last year when I did the same thing, I could not even be on site because I had a very bad stomach flu. And of course, some of the students freaked out. But I said, you are ready 
I am going to zoom in, but you're present as normal. So mm. control what you can control and let go of control on things that you cannot control. I love that story, Paul, because I think it really shows you can only control up to this much, right? And the rest of it, you have to kind of roll with whatever you're given, whatever the circumstances of the day it may be. And the challenge is this. I think a lot of us have no idea when to let go of the control. Like maybe I should do more because in our narrative, we have to do more than expected in many things. We, Singaporeans are known to, to have Over, plan A, plan B, C, D, yep, E, F, G, Over you know. And <laughs> in national service, we, you know, for the guys, you know, we've been taught all these things. Mm. But where do we stop? And I think there is no definitive answer to this, but I think there's something called saturation point. Yep. That means to say, in the example of my students, okay, you brought your laptops. Okay, sure, one laptop might break down. So mm. what can you do? Mm. Everyone in the group, four of you bring laptops. The chances of four people's laptops crashing at the same time is minuscule, but it can happen. But are you going to focus on that minuscule, you know, probability? No. Okay, so all bring your laptops. Mm -hmm. Okay, you all can dress up. Take control of that. Everyone dress up. Everyone right? prepare for your part. Everyone prepare for your part, right? Mm. And then just wait. All right, and wait do and do, just do what you can do. Yeah. I think that's great advice, even for general life. Perhaps let's switch gears a little bit. You are a father of three. And how do you see this with this understanding of what our uni students are struggling with or they may lack yeah, yeah. in that sense, right? Yeah. How does this influence the way you parent or how do you mm. parent differently then to prepare your kids for that kind of world and situations, life situations? Oh, fantastic question, June. <laughs> <laughs> I got three kids. Oldest is 17. In a couple of years, he's going to national service. Second kid is having PSLE this year. He's 12. Youngest is a girl. She's 10. And the first thing I realized is that everyone's character is different. Yep. In fact, sometimes I think I'm not a father. I think I'm a human resources manager. <laughs> <laughs> because because we talk about talent, right? So everyone is born different. They all have different skills. All three are different. It's so true. Yeah. Right? So although sometimes I realize that, yes, I know I'm a father, maybe sometimes that puts a little bit more unnecessary pressure on me. Hmm. Because as a father, I feel like I cannot mess up. But when I think of it as, okay, if I'm a human resources manager, I put on my managerial hat. And I start thinking, let me maximize their talents and maybe help support their weaknesses. So when I think of it from that perspective, I mean, it puts a bit less pressure on me. So example, Otis, he loves his studies, but he's a bit too hard on himself. The focus on him is to say that you have done very well to take control of what you can. Mm. Now you have to let go of what you cannot control. And mm. that means that I'm okay with you failing because failing is not in his vocabulary. For number two, it's a bit different. Failing is his vocabulary, but I'm teaching him to take control, mm. more control and to see situations as a challenge to overcome rather than a threat. With the youngest, for her, she is very committed to the task. And she has a little bit of a control issue, as in takes too much control. But one thing I love about her, she, she loves challenges. And so oh, one yeah. thing I like is I like to bring them together on holidays. It doesn't have to be far. Mm. It can even be nearby countries, right? A road trip up north. You should see us like when we went to Japan, taking the trains all are in one row pushing their luggages. Mm. It looks like a colony of ants moving towards uh, you know, honey or something like that. And I don't have to bark orders. I just say, okay, this is where we are going. And they just know what to do. And I like that because it brings them together. It helps them build a sense of resilience in a situations where they're uncertain. And today's world, I hate to say it, is really uncertain in many ways, right? One thing that's on my mind every day is how AI is going to change our landscape. Not going to talk too much about it, but AI has the ability to help us lose a lot of control. It seemingly can help us take control mm. of the things we do, but in reality, we are outsourcing it to AI that can handle a lot of things much better, and it can lead to a lot of uncertainty for humans. So raising kids in such a situation where they are so good with all these technologies, they start to make use of all of it, but when the technology fails, when AI overrides the human, you will see that in the future, young people might not know how to deal with the uncertainty of the failures in technology. 
And so the simple start for today is to just help them realize that this idea of hardiness and to just do what you can, stay committed to the task, right? And also and don't then, put all your eggs into one technology or, you yeah, know... Yeah, like, please, please don't, right? I mean... For example, you know, you said instead of one laptop, have four, exactly, diversify exactly. and look outwards. And there's paper. You can use paper also, yes, right? and you have yourself. And you, you have, have yourself. your own memories, exactly, right? Exactly. That you can commit your content to. Exactly. So, I love the direction of this podcast and what we've been discussing so far. And I really see that you've been so, so intentional. You said you wear your organizational hat, your HR hat, and then you look at, analyze your kids in terms of their talents and then where you can come and support. And even back to the three C's, commitment, control, and challenge, you can see how each child actually needs a different dosage of mm, each. Absolutely. Right? That absolutely. matches where they are. Before this, we were kind of chatting, right? And I was actually sharing that sometimes as parents, it's so hard. Parenting is probably the biggest lesson you can learn about mm. losing control, right? Yes, because absolutely. it's totally unpredictable. You don't <laughs> yep, know what yep, you're going to yep, get. Yep, 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 yep. <laughs> Even though as a mother, you know, you I've been carrying the child for like nine months, but yeah. it's still a very different yeah. ball game, yeah. right? When you bring a child into this world. Yeah. And uh, you don't know the personality of the child. And then some of it is nature. Some of it is nurture as well. And I actually have a confession to make, right? Sometimes... Mm. I see myself subconsciously, right, trying to step in to help, especially my youngest, who's 11 this year. Just small things. For example, I see mm. that he has not packed his water bottle into his bag. And then at night, I'll go and do it. I'll go and fill up his water and put it into his bag. And half the time, I'm always telling myself, like, why am I doing this? Why am I rescuing him from mm. a lesson that he could well learn yep. and that could actually help him to be more independent? Knowing this psyche of parents of wanting to, you know, just be helpful and, and just take control a little bit, <laughs> right? Because sometimes it's partly that you don't trust, perhaps, mm, mm, or you mm. don't want to lose that control over what's going to happen. Yeah. yeah. How yeah. do we deal with that? How do we get ourselves in control? <laughs> <laughs> you hit the nail on the head because this is, I think, every parent... Every responsible parent, can I say that? Uh, and most of us, I think, by and large, we, we do look out for our children. And mm. that's a very common thing. Yes, It's a very common uh, situation that I can identify with. If I use the same framework, the taking control <laughs> seems like, you know, and I know some people are just going to use this framework that I've just said and say, oh, yeah, yeah I'm taking control of the situation. <laughs> no. Actually, we have to dial yeah, back. You've got to let go on the control, right? Yeah. Because why? You're seeing the lack of water bottle packed in his bag as a threat. And what is that threat? Perhaps the threat is the fact that if you don't drink water, then he'll be thirsty. Maybe you see it as if you don't drink water, then he'll be sick. Then he's sick is a problem. Then you're going to waste money. Our brains can go very we, far. We can go very far, right? <laughs> yeah, which, which is why we have to uh, take control of that part. Yeah. But when you think about it, in counseling psychology, we say that your filling his water bottle on a regular basis is actually enabling. Yeah. It's an enabling behavior. Now, we say yeah. we do out of love and care, mm. but a lot of times we are afraid of them to fail. And that's another pet topic of mine. <laughs> and what does failure mean? Does it mean that, you know, it goes to school and there's no water and then throughout the whole day, dehydrated? Mm. Well, scientifically, he will not be dehydrated after also, half a day in school. Also, there are water coolers in and school, water thankfully. Coolers, right, <laughs> right. Yeah, so there are water coolers in so school. So actually, I... That yeah. The basic point is I have no excuse. <laughs> no, I, I wouldn't say that, right? See, I think you're too hard on yourself now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I think sometimes our way of love is we drown our children in love. Mm. But wow. that kind of love is not the kind of love that we should give them. We should mm. give them the love that helps them build up skills to manage challenges for the future. Even if it means, for example, my son, same thing, forgot to bring water bottle, right? No mm. money. He became resourceful. Mm. He borrowed money from his friend. Mm. <laughs> I'm like, not bad. So yeah. do I Can't condone survive. that? Yeah. Do I condone you not bringing? No, of course no. I don't. I don't agree. Yeah. But now you remember, yeah? And please remember to pay back your friend, okay? Mm. So what I do, same thing. If he doesn't have his water bottle, before you go to bed, have you packed your water bottle? Right. Mind. Yeah. That, yes? Okay, good. No? Okay. You know what you should do. Mm. I'm not going to do it for you. Mm. Right, you go to school thirsty. I hate to be harsh here, right? But mm. that's actually your problem. Mm. You have then to deal with the the cards that you know life mm. throws at you sometimes, and as a result of your own consequences of your actions. So it's definitely uncomfortable, right? This very, this part very, yeah. about learning to let go of this. But I think you said it well, and it's about investing in their growth, investing in their skills, 
which will take them further, mm. way, way further into mm. the future mm. Mm. than us doing it diligently every day for them. I'm also a counsellor. I'm counselling my clients when they are in their, say, late teens and early adulthood. There's this thing called parentification. And parentification is this thing where parents have too much hold on their kids such that they don't give them the chance to grow up and they don't give them the chance to manage life with skills. Mm. I have a friend, actually not one friend, I have a couple of friends <laughs> <laughs> in their 50s and they are still stuck in their primary school years because basically mother pack water bottle for them hasn't mm. left them in mm. their 50s. Mm. And it wow. has a lot of consequences for the family. Yeah. A lot of consequences for their careers. Their choice of life partners also is a very interesting thing, right? They tend to choose, you know, more maternal, directive kind of, mm. uh, maybe a bit more matriarchal kind of partners. It's very common and, and consistent kind of thing. And when you see that my clients, right, they are trying to get out of that hold the parents right. have over them. And yet right. the parents will say that, no, you, you know, you are my child. I have a responsibility for this. And yet the children will then say that, no, but I'm already 25, mom. I can even start mm. a family now. Some mm. don't even have bank accounts. What kind of future are you setting up for your child? And the choice of the life partner, the parents are going to come in and say that, no, cannot. Mm. So in the end, the child will rebel. So I think this is where the parents have to let go of what you cannot control. And you cannot control the growing up phase. The parenting part is the early years, right? Mm. The early years are very important, I believe. By teenage years, if you want to try and parent them, it's a bit too late. So the early part is important. Of course, it's never say never, right? If you have a teenager who is a bit wayward, there's still hope. But mm. if you can, if you're a young parent now, the early years are very important. The tone mm. you set, the habits you mm. practice. When they come to the 20s and late teens, I mean, my son, he comes back, you know, past midnight. I'm like, okay, I see the light is on. Okay, yeah, cool. I, I, I realized I got to let go and like stop texting him. Where are you? You know, I mean, easy for son. La. When my daughter gets to the age, maybe I have to <laughs> bite my words. <laughs> so they are, they're old enough, yeah. As a mom to my 11-year-old, mm. my youngest, I can, in a sense, take heart. So, okay, I've enabled this behavior for, let's say, the past few years. But even at this point, if I know that this is not going to help him, mm. I can start to make maybe small changes. Mm -hmm. Like you said, remind or remind myself what's the worst that could happen. Yeah. You know, there's always other backups in school that mm. he can turn to. And just let go, work myself out of that little task that I have <laughs> kind small. of grown Start accustomed small first, to, yeah. right? Small, yeah. yeah, so I think that's an encouragement for parents, even if you've been used to this for the past few years. Yeah. If your child is growing into teens, right, mm -hmm. into the teenage years, it's a really, really good thing to learn to let go and mm -hmm. to give them some of the autonomy, right? And that's, I guess, where it comes back to the topic of the day, right? Hardiness, yeah. as you said. It helps to build hardiness because they know that they can do certain things mm -hmm. on their own. And even by us doing it, perhaps it's kind of modeling for them as well. Being a parent, I, I know of newlywed couples who are saying that I don't have kids. I sense their concern, I sense their fears because how, how am I going to raise my child in a VUCA world, the word you use, in a very uncertain world. Uh, but I think I see it as a challenge to overcome <laughs> rather than a threat to escape from. But if we don't have kids, it's something I think that is beyond the financial gratification or mm -hmm. the return on investment. It's something different. And I think quite early on, I said to myself, hey, having kids is a no-brainer, mm -hmm. right? If we can physically have kids, we have kids. Yeah. You know, seeing them now, I realize that I've done most of my parenting already. <laughs> and strangely enough, I think I'm now parenting my student <laughs> in, a, in a very in a different um, way. In a very different yeah. way. But Back to your story of, you know, journeying with them through the uncertainties. There's this guy there on the trip. And it was really interesting because I think it's the first time he actually had liking for someone and wow. he was like contacting me like all the time oh. <laughs> and he was like prof 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 you know hey you know this one that yeah and that one yeah and I'm like, okay cool you know it's yeah you know i give some tips i don't do you know do too much you know mm. and i said give some perspective mm. and i think he enjoyed the process i think sometimes we're too sensible and too practical and we start to just shut people down and say no no no, no you know you're not gonna it's not gonna work out right i know it's not gonna work out but mm. You know, just, just enjoy the feeling, mm. right? Enjoy the fact that, you know, it's a moment you remember for a long time. So it's like 
just encouraging them to grow and go through the process yeah, without yeah. even, you know, worrying too much about even the rejection process. Outcome. Yeah. I mean, if whoever you express your feelings to, yeah. and you know, you get rejected, I kind of prepared him for it. I'm like, it's okay. Uh, no today may not be no tomorrow, mm. but if it's a no, then just know that you enjoyed this moment and yeah. it was nice. That's such a good perspective. Yeah. Right. I wish we had more time to deal with that. But maybe <laughs> another podcast. Part two, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us today and for sharing all your insights. It's really sad we have to let you go, but do you have any sort of last words you want to share with our listeners? who are parents, uh, many of whom may struggle with this letting go? Well, thanks for having me, June. Last words. It's tough. There are so many words I want to say. <laughs> First of all, if you are a parent, you might not feel what I'm saying now, but congratulations because you are contributing to something bigger than yourself. If you're a parent and you know that whatever I've said it resonates with you, I hope that this is a reinforcement for what you believe to be true and continue the good work you have done. But for those who feel like what we've just discussed today uh, is a wake-up call, it's never too late. It's never too late. Nothing is wasted. And if you think that you are inadequate, in dealing with whatever situation you're facing with, then it might be a good idea to seek help. Maybe counseling support, maybe the social services. It's not wrong. It's never too late. Well said. Thanks once again, Paul. Thanks for having me. For our listeners out there, we hope you have benefited from this podcast and will be able to share this podcast with a friend or a parent who may benefit from it as well. For more parenting resources, do visit our website at family.org.sg. And do keep tuning in to the Paranet Podcast to learn and grow in your parenting journey.